Okay, so welcome once again. Um, and thank you all for joining. Um, we're very happy to have this opportunity to talk to our members and committers about some changes that we're considering for, um, for modernizing our IP processes. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'll dive right into the presentation. I think there's, um, uh, there's a lot of good content here. Uh, there, we, there will be time for questions at the end, uh, given that there's quite a, quite a big group here, I would suggest that we, uh, if we, if it's okay, we'll, we'll ask, we'll wait for questions at the very end. And I do hope that there's, uh, that you have some. So, um, let's just get started, uh, with some background and history in terms of, uh, of the IP processes that we've had it for many years at the Eclipse Foundation. So if you recall, the Eclipse Foundation was, uh, created in 2004, uh, when it came into being in uh, January, January of 2004. And around that time, uh, copyright provenance was a very big deal um, in, the, um, in the open source world. Uh, and part of that was being uh, uh, as a result of the, S, the very famous SEO lawsuit where SEO uh, sued IBM and others related to um, uh, the Unix uh, relationship between Unix and Linux. Um, and so the, the initial IP policy at the Eclipse Foundation uh, required a deep analysis of every third party dependency before they could even be used in a build. And at that point, distribution was defined as simply placing a third party dependency into a, an Eclipse Foundation source repository. Um, and in 2006, there was a policy that was approved by the board um, that, uh, that, that regulated how the use of third-party dependencies would happen uh, at the Eclipse Foundation projects. Um, so if you're an Eclipse committer, you're familiar with terms like, is it a prerequisite or is it a work with dependency? Um, and all of that was originally motivated to um, prevent projects from circumventing the intent of our processes, which was to make sure that we did a deep dive IP analysis on, on our third-party dependencies. Um, and another thing that's really important to understand and, and part of the motivation here is that our existing tools and infrastructure are, are ancient and really, really must be replaced. Uh, probably the best example of that is IPZilla, um, which is a, uh, it's behind a firewall. Um, you need a, you know, a user ID and password to get to it, but it is running a 15 year old unpacked version of Bugzilla. And uh, so it's, 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 it really it does need to be replaced. Um, another important factor uh, is that the Eclipse Foundation was originally conceived as a single license foundation, similar to the Apache Software Foundation. So, of course, every single project at Apache uses the, um, the Apache license. Uh, and that was, you know, the original concept of the Eclipse Foundation. That actually hasn't been true since 2006, when we first started accepting dual license projects, uh, the very first one being Eclipse Link. And over time, we've transitioned to being more of a multi-license foundation like the Linux Foundation, where uh, we have uh, accepted projects under um, uh, quite a multitude of, of licenses. Um, and the other thing is that industry expectations have really changed since 2004. Um, and you know, industry best practices are now focused on license compliance. Well, and also security, but that's a different topic, but license compatibility is a key part of this. Uh, and so the, uh, if you look at the, what typically companies are doing in their own uh, open source compliance offices, they're really spending time to make sure that the licenses are, are compliant um, and, can, and, and that they're consistent across uh, a, a distribution to make sure that they're complying with all of the various bits of uh, reporting and, and notifications and compatibility between all of the licenses. Uh, another big uh, trend is that the importance of software bill of materials to ensure that downstream consumers understand what they're getting. Um, there's also a link of, with SBOMS back to security, but it's, um, um, but simply being able to document and report um, what is in your software is becoming increasingly important. And uh, finally, automation. Uh, you know, 2004 open source was far newer um, and, um, uh, than, than it is today. It's open source is clearly mainstream and 
the scale at which we are doing things. Uh, Nuri, please go on mute um, if you're not. Bert Hansen's on part. En gros, en gros, c'est quoi tu tu veux quoi en gros sur la sur la part trois c'est quoi? Tu veux quoi? Tu veux en gros après on regarde la part trois. I have muted Bart. Um, and open source automation is is now really important. So, uh, and this is we, this is very much true at the Eclipse Foundation as well. Um, and relying on manual processes are, is no longer tenable. So here's the, the crux of the proposal that, that, we've, uh, that uh, we've got. There's, there's, two, there's two slides here that really tries to explain the things that we want to change um, in, in our IP policy. So the first is the EPL, the Eclipse Public License, is called out in our IP policy as being a special default across numerous places. Um, and we, we want to change that so that the IP policy uh, no longer calls out um, the EPL as, as being special. Uh, and the, um, so that's a, whoops, that's the first change. The second change is we want to really focus our energies on license compliance. Um, and so ensuring the licenses are compat compatible across all of our distributions on a per project basis. Um, and um, we want to actually, another thing is to change the, um, the license approval processes. So that's managed by the staff uh, at the Eclipse Foundation rather than going um, to the board um, for approvals. And that's really a, an efficiency thing, you know. So we've been doing this for a long time. Um, what was once novel is now routine. Um, it used to be used to, you know, made sense that we would go to the board every single time that we wanted to introduce a new license to um, um, to Eclipse projects. Uh, but at the scale that we're working at now, um, putting the board in the middle of those and that analysis no longer really makes sense. Um, now, one of the major ramifications um, from this is that for a long time, it was sort of an underlying assumption that if you were working on an Eclipse project, that you could you know, freely cut and paste code from another Eclipse Foundation project and not have to worry about any license compatibility issues. Um, that assumption is no longer going to be true. Um, so you're actually going to have to pay attention to uh, the license of the projects. And sometimes that might be perfectly fine. And other times uh, that, uh, that, might not, that might not work. Um, second part of the radical proposal is we want to eliminate all manual record keeping requirements for dependencies. Um, so revoke the existing policy on third party dependencies and, and only track what's being distributed by our projects. Um, deprecate, shut down IPZilla and get rid of contribution questionnaires. Um, and to the degree that any manual record keeping um, is still required, uh, you know, it was, still will be times where there there are questions to be asked and discussions to be had. Um, and we will move those kinds of conversations into our public GitLab um, to support them. Um, but the idea that we're going to, you know, a priori uh, make a request uh, for using a third party dependency in, in a project um, will we'll simply go away um, and we'll, uh, we'll rely on, um, uh, on automation to define those and report those. Um, eliminate the requirement for IP logs um, and retire and rely entirely on software bill of materials and Git logs for communicating the provenance of our code. Um, as far as we can tell, uh, IBM was really the only company that ever made systematic use of our IP logs. Um, and so doing, um, putting that burden on our projects um, really no longer makes sense, especially with the, the combination of um, automatically generating SBOMs and, and Git logs. Um, can basically replicate what we've been doing in IP logs anyways. And finally, really, um, really double down on, on automation and implement build time license compliance tools such as the um, Open Source Review Toolkit or ORT. Um, automate the license compliance checking of all third-party dependencies. Of course, automate to the degree possible. There's always going to be some, um, um, some scenarios that will re uh, require human intervention. Um, and automate the creation of machine readable SBOMs um, and make those available to our downstream consumers. 
So why are we doing this? Um, we think this is bringing our processes in line with current uh, industry best practices. Um, it's clearly going to improve our ability to scale um, and um, which is a very, very big part of, of why we're doing this because uh, we are increasingly getting uh, larger and more complex projects. Um, and uh, then next one is reduce the IP due diligence burden on our projects, our committers and our staff. And that's also related to ability to scale. Um, so, you know, reducing the IP due diligence burden is, is, a, is a big part of why we're doing this. Uh, partially because we wanna actually do more around automation and automation of SBOMs. And we also wanna start to do more in the area of security as well. Uh, it deprecates old infrastructure, um, which reduces the burden on our IT staff um, and, um, and, and gets rid of things which in our infrastructure, which uh, could be potential security uh, uh, problems or, or vectors for hacks, um, you know, doing things like running 15 year old un, unpatched versions of Bugzilla. Um, and really focus on automating all of the things. Um, now, of course, so as I mentioned before, there's always going to be times where, um, you know, we will have to bring humans into the loop, uh, but, you know, automate the alerts uh, and the exceptions um, and, and to bring humans involved rather than making manual processes where humans are involved um, all the, in, in every single instance. So how do we actually do this? Um, so from a board decision and timeline, um, the first and foremost is this is going to require some changes to our IP policy to remove the references to the EPL, um, adjust the record keeping requirements to reflect the new approach. Um, there's going to be uh, board resolutions required to revoke um, the some policies like implementing the IP policy and implementing the third part, the third party dependencies. Um, <clears throat> the Revisions, um, well, you know, in April and May um, are going to be available to the board and the members. Uh, we do have draft revisions um, to the IP policy that we'll be making available, um, and uh, looking forward to anybody's comments on those. And the intent is is to vote on this in the June board meeting with the updated policy to go into a place uh, 30 days later, so uh, tentatively scheduled for July 29th, 2022. Um, Originally, when I did this presentation, I said, if it's possible to complete sooner, we'll make the attempt. But I think uh, at this point, it's um, safe to assume that um, this is the, the timeline that, that, that we're on. And I think that, so that concludes my presentation. Um, and I'm hoping that folks have questions. Yes, uh, BJ, please go ahead. Yeah, um, so I'm not sure if you covered it. I don't, I don't recall having heard it, but I'm assuming this applies across all projects, even those that are specification projects. Um, yes, although specification projects, the, you're, you're talking about the actual text of the specification itself, this would apply, um, but it's, they're kind of a simpler case because a spec project doesn't have the, you know, the collection of third party dependencies that a, that a typical open source project will have. Well, I think that probably depends on the spec project. I mean, I'm using OSGI as my example, right? We have a spec project that produces TCKs that use third party dependencies. It produces compatible implementations that use third party dependencies. In addition to producing API jars and, you know, the textual specification in the form of HTML or PDF or something. So it, it, there can be mixed bags. So every spec project at Eclipse has compatible implementations and TCKs. That is that is the definition of a spec. So yes, for the pieces of running code that make up the TCK and the compatible implementations, yes, all of this applies to those. Great, okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, Emilio, please go ahead. Yeah, are the tools to do the automated software bill of materials, are those available anywhere to try out yet? Uh, uh, specifically, 
uh, the project I'm on. We're using Java and Maven. So um, actually, uh, uh, I'll turn the microphone over to my colleague, Wayne Beaton, who I think would probably be best suited to answer that. So the thanks, Mike. Uh, and thanks for the question. Uh, the short answer is we have started to do this and we are actually generating some S-bombs for some projects. Uh, we're not quite ready to be accepting candidates to, to, to you know, for testing. Um, so it's certainly not for, you know, for general, general use, but we are well on our, on our way to having um, the automation in place. Uh, is, just again, we're not quite ready to be generating the S-bombs for, for projects. Yeah, so hey, Wayne, is there a, um, a mailing list or a project or a repo that interested parties could follow along on, on progress on this topic? I'm glad you asked, Mike. Um, yeah, so I've today, starting today and early next week, I will start opening issues to track all of the various aspects of everything that we are doing. And uh, yes, uh, I, I actually haven't figured out the answer to which mailing list, but I will use the committer mailing list to uh, make sure that I inform everybody of where the discussion is happening. Uh, and we will do that again probably early next week. Like this is really kind of the first step of second step, I guess, of informing the community that we are, we are doing this. So we, you know, we, we will start the, um, yeah, again, move, move all of, move all of our work into the public, uh, visible to everybody. So again, relatively early days, but, uh, we are on track to, to be generating. We are actually generating S bombs for some projects. Um, but, uh, not, not generally at this point. So, uh, Angelica, I think you had your hand up for a question. Um, yes. So, uh, first, I, I really love the approach. I love the way going to complete automatization. Um, my, my question would be, um, if, I mean, I have looked into some S-bombs. They are not really human readable. They are perfectly machine readable, I think. So do we still have to create notice files that are human readable? So um, uh, I'll, I'll let Wayne answer that question, but I think the answer is yes. Notice S-bombs do not replace notice files. Unless, unless Wayne is about to say that I'm, that's completely wrong. <laughs> Apparently, Mike and I need to have a discussion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and is then, if we still have to, to create uh, notice files, is there also a way to create them? Well, theoretically, then, if we can generate an SBOM, we should be able to generate an, a notice file. So yeah. if we need both, Write a then, parser and... If, yeah, if we need both, then <laughs> we'll figure that out. So this okay. would be one of the things that we will discuss on a, on a, on a public issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so yes, sorry. Wayne's, Wayne's right and I was, I was incorrect. So if SBOMs could potentially replace uh, notice files, um, the, real, the real key thing here is the point that I made earlier in the presentation about automate all the things. Um, to the degree that notices and so on will need to be continued to be produced. We are going to be doing as much as we can to automate those for, for projects as, as, as we can. Uh, BJ? Yeah, well, with regard to the automation, aut automation and the, uh, need, the desire to produce S-bombs, which I think is great, do we see that there are existing tools support in the world, or is this something Eclipse is going to have to work on, right? For example, if I have a Maven build, is there some plugin that will exist to generate my SBOM for me, or does each project sort of have to roll its own? So, um, so early, our, our early testing has, um, we've, we found that the uh, open source review toolkit, OSS review toolkit, pardon me, that Mike referenced earlier, does a pretty good job of generating the SBOM. Um, I can talk at length about, about the tool, but uh, I think I'll defer that discussion for now. But, but the idea is that we have a system, we're, we're going to set up a system, and my hope is that we get the, the classical 80% um, you know, of all projects 
I'm hopeful that we can hit an 80% target where we, we literally grab your repository, we scan it and we generate an SBOM and we keep it in a particular location. And then if my, my, my greatest dreams are realized, we actually make a pull request and give it to you. Okay, so you're saying it would be externally generated and then given back as opposed to a thing produced by the project's own build. So we could, I, we could support both or even, you know, if a project really feels strongly that they can do a better job than we can, then uh, I would be supportive of a project generating their own. But our intention is to use automation to generate these four projects. And then the but question, that, be, and then the question so, be comes sort of like, so now we have this textual artifact called an SBOM. Do we, do we do a pull request and, you know, ask the project to include it in its repo? Or do we have a can can canonical repository where all of these live, where somebody can look it up for a, for, for a given Eclipse project release? Um, or, and, or, or both. Or both, or yeah, exactly. Um, or make it a choice. A project can, 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 can do which one they choose. So like these are kind of like implementation details that um, are yet to be worked out. Uh, right, that sort of speaks to timeliness though because projects can change quickly and and offline generated SBOMs can get out of date. Um, so that's all, that's why I think something in the build with the build itself generates it is going to be the most reliable. Um, yeah, so I, integrating with the build is, is you know, absolutely the right idea. Um, if your S bombs are getting out of whack with static released artifacts, then that's a use case I need to understand more. Well, you change the version, right? Dependapot's currently telling me here's a new version of this and here's a new version of that. So the S bomb is more than just the name of the thing. It's got to have a version if it has any value for the purposes of security analysis and other things. Absolutely. And versions are constantly changing. And, you know, like I no, you know, I. I used a very important word, BJ, release, <laughs> release. Like, yes, your builds change every single day. Totally get that. And so you want to keep your SBOM current, but there are things called releases that, that stay static for, for hopefully forever. Right. That's, that's the case. Those are two different use cases. Right. So that means that would have to be part of triggered by a release process, which sometimes for a service release is very lightweight and may not even involve the foundation. Yep. So, so we will look forward to, I will look forward to your input into this process. Ooh, uh, you know, the, we, we, we don't, you. we, we don't have all of the answers. I have a lot of them, but you know, we're looking forward to your input. Right. No, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you have to have the answers. I just didn't know what direction your thoughts were leading. Uh, so my thoughts are leading to, we try to, we, we generate it. We do as much of the work as possible in an automated fashion. And uh, again, with where, where that doesn't work, we, we, we have a different solution. Um, so just, just one of the things that I'm hopeful that happens here is we're, we're turning the whole IP, the way committers engage with the IP process uh, around. Uh, like as Mike was saying, it used to be that you had to um, submit stuff to the IP team and you know, wait for them to tell you that it was okay. What the, with this mode, basically you start using something, we detect it. If we're not sure about the licensing of that content, we do a review. This is all happening in an automatic way. And periodically, the IP team will come and tap a committer on the shoulder and say, we can't resolve this, can you help me? Um, but the idea is for, you know, again, the 80% target, 80% of the time, the committer is just working and we are detecting and resolving the issues behind the scenes. And early experiments are, have, are really showing a lot of promise that this is this will work. Um, Chris Vega had his hand up for a while. Did Chris, do you have a question? Uh, question was, while we are using automatic S-bomb generation a lot here at Mercedes, uh, one of the issues that we are running into periodically is that the copyright information is not correct. Uh, we are relying on a knowledge base from a commercial vendor. And in many cases, the copyright information is at some places where uh, it is not uh, located by the bots who are building up the knowledge base. So uh, do you have any ideas how that could be solved? Would that all involve manual curation on your side? 
Yeah, un unfortunately, when the information can't be automatically determined, uh, some curation, yeah, some manual creation is required. So, yeah. Yes, that that is going to be a challenge that we have to deal with. Okay. So there's some questions on the chat that I want to address. So no, this is not going to require a specific build tool and no, we're not going to be installing GitHub plugins. Um, think of it more, we have metadata through the uh, PMI where for each Eclipse Foundation project, we know where the repositories are, uh, whether they're on GitHub or GitLab or our own, own uh, CGIT. Um, and we can use that metadata to, to initiate scans um, of the source of the source repos and so that's that's more the mechanism so this is not going to be we're not going to be mandating that all clips you know all clips projects have to start using a particular build tool um, we're in th that kind of stuff so um, um, but I think the most important part of the message here is that we are going to be rolling out um, some ideas and some concepts the implement there's a there's a myriad of implementation details that need to be worked out. The point of this call was not to go all engineering on us. The point of this call is to basically talk about the direction that we're going in, and hopefully, I, um, you know, people recognize that this is a significant reduction in the the burden that we've been putting on projects historically. Um, with you know, so with the caveat that there's lots of details to work out later. Um, we are um, hoping that people um, take this as a as a positive development for projects at the Eclipse Foundation. I see one hand up. Who is that? It's it's John Val. Um, so I'm sort of surprised uh, so it's, don't get me wrong it seems like a, a brilliant idea and, and, I, and i like the direction very much but i'm sort of surprised that you think that by scanning the the source control system for each eclipse project you can work out all the third parties dependencies irrespective of what build tool they're using without understanding oh. having to understand every possible build tool so the um the ORT tool actually understands a lot of the build technology and how to discover third-party content. Um, ultimately, though, we do depend on committers understanding what they have and, uh, and what they're doing. And if a committer you know, knows that the, or it, we, we would like, we, you know, committers are still going to have to you know, check to make sure that what we're generating is right at some level, right? If you're doing straight Maven, then you know, that one's relatively easy. When you like add a third party file somewhere buried deep in the middle of something that we have to, you know, again, we will, we would detect that with the license information. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm getting, I'm going to, I'm risking a rat hole here. Uh, yeah, it's, it is a problem. Um, and, you know, again, we look forward to your input into the process, but generally we're, um, you know, uh, this ORT tool supports Maven and Go and NPM and, all sorts of other package manager based technologies. One of the big gaps is um, detecting dependencies for C builds, make, make builds is I think not possible in an automated fashion. Make, so yeah. 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 So, so I'll be interested to be involved in, in how we can help make that easier for Eclipse and for me. Right. Well, so yeah, this is why, this is why I, I started by saying you know, we're going to try and hit the 80% because there's always going to be, I was looking at a build this morning and there's, I don't see how we can automate that one. Right? Yeah. So we'll have to figure out how to deal with that. Yeah. I mean, it's really clear that the state of the art of the tools is not going to allow 100%, you know, fire and forget automation. Um, it's really about changing the workflows <clears throat> to reduce the, uh, the burden on our committers and to automate as much as possible. And, and the as much as possible is going to be, you know, a, a slider that's going to change over time. Um, and, uh, and at, you know, we'll do everything that we can at the beginning and, and then hopefully improve over time and, and iterate and learn together. And with that, we are well over time. Um, so I'm going to stop recording. And uh, but before I do, just want to thank everybody for uh, for joining. And I um, really appreciate the the questions and the feedback.
Um, we at the staff, and I could say at the board um, of the Eclipse Foundation are very excited about this direction that we're going in. Um, and um, we see this as a significant improvement for the Eclipse Foundation and its projects and its project community. And uh, so uh, well, I'm looking forward to being able to roll this all out. And we will be setting up some um, mailing lists and repos and places where people can uh, can can follow along. And, and we look forward to your, uh, your feedback um, throughout. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll stop recording. <laughs>